arts. It's about maintaining resilience and integrity in tough times. It's about having foresight in the face of increasing cuts and pressure towards private sector sponsorship. In the week where Tate was forced by an information tribunal to disclose its sponsorship figures from BP and to unredact a lot of its ethics committee minutes in the public interest. Welcome. <laughs>
when I was speaking to, to one of the curators at the San Paolo Biennial, Charles Eske, he, he pointed out really strongly that, of course, no funding, public or private, is without ideology. He, he made the point in the 70s when here we had far more public subsidy, there was a Cold War ideology that was prevailing. And that organizations that were in some way reflecting, however subtly, the Cold War ideology of the, of the state were in a better position than those that won. So I think that's just something to bear in mind. And also, from an international perspective, many of the, the protests that we're seeing are against, are against governments. I mean, there were huge protests against Manifesta. There was an artist boycott, the Contemporary Art Show in Moscow, because of the Russian government who sponsored it, because of the situation in Ukraine. Um, where do you start? Probably like this, with a conversation that just by the fact of its existence tells you that attitudes are changing. It's a very messy, contradictory business, but it's probably better than just taking the money and running. Thank you. We saw Artwash in action at Tate in its most sort of perfect form. We saw Tate in 2010 hold its annual summer party, but that year it chose to celebrate 20 years of BP sponsorship of the set of art galleries across the UK. Myself and another woman entered the party and went right upstairs to the champagne reception where all the guests were gathered. And we'd gone in in these big flowery bouffant dresses. We'd carried 10 litres of molasses beneath our skirts. As we entered, we walked slowly so they didn't sway too much. And a few people glanced over. Why are they wearing matches dresses? Why are they walking so slowly? We made it to the centre of the party and we spilled the oil across the floor of the gallery. And we then tried to clean it up as if we were BP, making a total mess up job of the clean up as they were doing across in the US at that time. 2015 is a big year because we think that this is probably the decision making year for a lot of institutions on this issue. The ones that have sponsorship from BP are Tate, British Museum, the Royal Opera House and the National Portrait Gallery. And that contract is almost up. So now is really the time to give it a good kick. It's important that we get oil out of our galleries right now because as the pressure of climate change mounts, we need these spaces of creativity and reflection to be ones where we can think about the position of oil in our cultures. And we can't do that when oil sponsors are right there in the gallery with us, restricting the way that we look at this and imagine uh, this situation and the future. So read Artwash when it comes out, get in touch if you want to organize any events with us, um, join uh, any of the groups who are doing stuff around oil sponsorship of the arts. The tables are ready to turn on this issue, we just need to give them a good shove. The entire tar, tar sands infrastructure in Canada has been the subject of extensive criticism for clear-cutting boreal forests, polluting waterways, and some indigenous communities that live downstream of the polluted waterways are experiencing higher than expected rates of rare cancers. According to a, a, a report by the Alberta Health Services released in 2009 in Fort Chippewa, a remote community 300 kilometers north of Fort McMurray, often described as, as the grand zero of tar sands extraction. 51 cancers developed in 47 people between 1995 and 2006. Almost a third more than would have been stati statistically predicted. Extracting oil from tar sands is far more polluting and destructive to the climate than light, sweet, crude oil, which comes naturally out of the ground in liquid form. Tar sands are only 10% oil mixed with 90% sand, clay and corrosive agents such as quartz and other minerals, heavy metals and volatile <coughs> organic compounds. The problem with boycotting the Biennale or other art institution in regard to a particular issue, oil, arms, gay rights, gentrification, is that it implies that the institution under normal circumstances would be okay. What happens when the corporate sponsor that fails the vetting process of consumer responsibility is successfully ousted from the art institution? Does another, slightly less objectionable corporate sponsor take its place? What kind of corporation is politically acceptable? Banks, supermarkets, car manufacturers, fashion brands, agribusinesses, global coffee chains? Or are we thinking of ethical banks, ethical car corporations, ethical fashion brands? <laughs> My view is that no capitalist organisation 
can possibly be politically or ethically acceptable so long as its existence depends entirely on exploitation. As such, I find it impossible to get behind any campaign against this or that corporate sponsor. I want the abolition of corporate sponsorship for the arts. Full stop. Actually, I would extend this to a ban on all advertising too, but that's for another meeting. <laughs> So, as a result of the artist boycott, the Biennale chairman, whose family were pretty much responsible for founding the Biennale, surprisingly resigned, and then went on to sell all shares and sever all ties with Transfield. This was um, an astonishing outcome for everyone involved. Uh, the politicians then publicly waded in, and the artists were immediately slammed for burning the dollars of the private sponsors' money in order to make party political points. They were accused of vicious ingratitude. Um, and our federal arts minister, Senator George Brandis, um, responded by placing significant pressure on the Australia Council for the Arts to adopt a policy punishing artists and arts organisations for rejecting sponsorship monies that may compromise their ethics. At this point, we, and when I say we, it was initially a small group of West Australian artists working at our incubator space here at CIA Studios. We put out a call to the rest of the Perth art sector across all disciplines to mobilise and get as informed as possible so that we could decide on a course of action. We gathered here at CIA and invited the Refugee Rights Action Network to come and talk about protest actions that were happening around asylum seeker issues. We interviewed one of the Biennale boycotters, Gabrielle de Vietri, to give her perspective on what happened, like a blow-by-blow -blow account and how the artists were holding up. And we also interviewed the director of the National Peak Body for the Visual Arts, um, NAVA, to advise on possible courses of action um, that could be taken from a sector perspective. Then we broke into working groups to discuss where to next. And from that initial meeting, the Artistic Resistance Network was formed, which has decided to focus its energies on developing creative strategies for protesting against the mandatory detention of asylum seekers. Um, and the Ethical Arts Resource emerged as a result of us questioning why it was that as an art sector, we don't have any ethical sponsorship guidelines available to us. And if we did have some guidelines, what might they look like? And how could each artist or arts org adapt these guidelines to suit their own agenda or ethical standing? A boycott that is part of the movement, part of any a broader political action, part of organizing with other people, that has a lot of power. And the stuff around oil is a particularly good case because what we have there is a boycott that's not just a few artists feeling uncomfortable about oil money, but a boycott that is being demanded by the constituencies most affected, the people on the sharp and genocidal end of environmental racism. They are asking us to be part of a boycott as part of a broader political campaign. And if we're not part of that boycott, we are portraying those people most affected who are asking for it. It's no use collaborating with oil companies if the people who are affected by their practices are asking us to do something else. We need to listen to them and, and take the action that they are asking of us. One of the things about the position of gratitude is that you're in a position of supplication. You're saying, thank you very much, you know, we're just very grateful, very grateful, just nod your head, will you fall off? And that's a position of relative powerlessness. If you want to engage in changing these things, as the guy before said, we have to think about power and not be in a position of supplication. I'm inspired by the situation in Greece and Syriza. One of the things that's interesting about it is that they say, we will not be subject. We will not be subject to this situation. And of course, their situation is extremely difficult to get out of it. But their founding point is, we will not be subject. What interests me is that the illustration of, that Heather and Dan gave of sponsorship from the Aliyev Foundation and Lelia Aliyev is that they, that sponsorship requested and required the artists to be subject. And their action of taking action against it and saying we're not going to be part of it is an action of taking power and saying we will not be subject. We will stand up to this. And if the more people they can do that with and work together with, the more power they have.
and the more that we can actually affect change in this area. I'm quite interested in how little you touch the complexity of the world. Uh, but it's urgent to talk about it as well because meanwhile you're fighting here in the front line in England, the citizens are dying in Mexico because of parking, because of oil, because they have already a system in place from indigenous, a different economic system that protects this creativity, that imposes a different state of mind. All what we're talking right now. And I just don't see a lot of it, a lot of this conversation. So I don't know what to do or who can listen to me saying that the students are being killed because of this um, education is being killed and a whole cultural system has been killed because of what's happening in the front line here and in the front line there. So um, if you can tell me what can I do now? for this complexity, global complexity, I would be really happy to help. I'm really new at this. I'm an actress in Mexico, and I just started to do performance arts. Um, and I actually think that the agenda of the art institutions that we've been talking about this morning is actually reflected in our studios directly. Um, and maybe students have never been so alienated, uh, but at the same time, never been so aware of the conditions that we're actually subject to. They, I mean, they, they, it seems that the culture of artists actually supporting each other has tends to um, has become sort of diluted, I think, in, in the sense that the institutions push for a really sort of self-interested um, kind of agenda um, of sort of success and sort of targets. Um, instead of actually a sort of community, which is what you can kind of feel when you're in a space like this. Um. Richard Lee from uh, Joe Space and Stage Text. So I'm a the theatre maven and I'm absolutely passionate about it. And I know that the, the huge increase in access to um, theatre in London would not have come about without the intervention of Travelex. It's made an enormous difference. You dig deep in travel X and you know, maybe there are things going on there that are not so great. I, I have to look at the, um, I suppose, the positives from that. And it's about taking those positives and moving forward with those that, that's important to me. So, I think over to Lucy. <laughs> there's, there's so much to unpack here today. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of key words. And one of them was from Ken Mikulski, which was compass. Um, another has been change, which is something that um, quite a lot of people have talked about. And um, I'm really kind of grateful to people like um, Lucy Neal um, and people who worked over many years on these issues um, for kind of setting the agenda and also, you know, thinking really deeply about what it means to engage um, or disengage. And I, I think that. You know, the, the answers to these questions um, are not um, singular. Um, they're definitely things that need to be changed on many different levels. So um, engaging with corporations might be a choice for some people. Um, protests um, and politicisation might be a choice for some people. Um, working on policy, which I think was really interesting in terms of um, Ken McCluskey's example, is, may also be a choice. I think more, crucially there's also an emphasis on artists as being entrepreneurs. So instead of, I'm sure most, a lot of you feel like this, instead of being an artist, you, you're called on to be a producer, a marketer, a fundraiser, and all, you have to develop all these other skills rather than making the art you make. That's always been the case. However, in this context perhaps it's more the case that we have to do all these things. And it changes what an artist can be, and crucially for me, it reinforces the, uh, the move towards a neoliberal capitalist ideology that I was referring to earlier. So everybody is individually responsible, increasingly individually responsible for sponsoring and funding my own work. Um, that reinforces a, a neoliberal emphasis on the responsibility of the individual to realize his or herself. In some respects, I'm sympathetic to that, but, but on the other hand, I think that means, well, what about the state which supports structurally the development of agreed values, like having a healthy, vibrant, diverse art sector. The third um, issue I have with this in this context is, is in relation to the stuff around um, ethics and, and uh, funding, is the question of 
why are, I mean, why artists have to be the kind of vanguard standing against unethical businesses? And I think we should, you know, artists and, and academics, we should be that we should be doing that. And should it only be our responsibility? Or should it chiefly be our responsibility? Are there other organizations, or should everyone else also be responsible for thinking about the ethics of businesses and good, sound business practice? Would you approach Barclays Bank for funding? Some people are getting a lot of exercise, aren't they? Would you approach the co-op bank for funding? And if so, when? <laughs> a year ago? Um, would you approach Unilever for funding? Unilever. You don't know, don't worry. Would you approach Boots the Chemist? for funding. Mm. Okay. Last question. Would you approach the EU for funding? Okay. All right. So, I mean, this is a what in the workshops that we've devised. This is a kind of warm up you into the zone of thinking what what, what is going you know a lot of this is gut reaction isn't it actually and i'd like to brave people round of applause for brave people before saying a little bit more about the ethical funding work which we've actually done and implemented i'd like to share some information about three key factors um, which provide hopefully some important context of what we were doing. Uh, firstly, uh, our three organizations work with live art and performance practices. Um, and that may represent a number of challenges to the idea of the market and the expectations of the rich. Live art can be subversive and radical. And as the artist David Hoyle recently said as he emceed um, a fundraising gala which the Live Art Development Agency held. Why would the rich want to pay for their own demise? <laughs> As part of our catalyst research, which included talking with directors of development and fundraisers at a range of different types of organizations, we were driven by the goal to ensure that our fundraising approaches would be aligned with our missions, values, programs, and ways of working. Could our fundraising messages be informed by long-standing, tried and tested fundraising principles, but also be true to our sometimes radical and politicized work? Which might explicitly call into question why we're fundraising from individuals and why state provision for the arts is in decline. And I think it's worth making the distinction between the conversation that you've been having, which I think is really interesting and useful, around the need to have an ethical policy, the need to ask questions, and the need to, to set that up for yourself as an organisation. And to a large extent, I think, to an individual. And actually those individual decisions. As we saw from the exercise where people were standing on the stage, there's a whole range of values that people have, and a whole range of values that organisations have, and reasons for doing that. And because of that, that's why at the moment, at the Arts Council, we think it's completely inappropriate for us to say, as in anybody in receipt of public funds, should or shouldn't take, them, take money from certain sources. Per personally, yeah, there's all sorts of things that, that I, I wouldn't want organisations so, to take their money from, but that has to be an individual decision, because there are obviously very good reasons why um, some of us want to take money from Tesco or, or, or whoever it is, and that's fine. The important thing is to have that discussion and ask those questions, which is exactly what you've been talking about this morning. You have to be very resilient, and forms of resistance can also, of course, be the form of the project. And Mary and I were just on last thought to share. We were just talking about um, the forms of resistance that um, artists and others um, enact 
uh, generally within our lives and within our working projects and how each one of those might not necessarily be the form that we would choose, but I'd like to think that all forms of resistance, um, whatever the form, you know, are, are points and nodes for huge change, potentially. So I think it's always very interesting, not necessarily to um, suggest that one way is better than another way, but that we have multiplicity of approaches to um, trying to support each other collectively in perhaps um, from ideological positions that might not necessarily always be completely shared. I'm just interested in the fact we've been using um, ethics and values quite interchangeably as, as concepts and I'm keen to kind of um, kind of tease out these two things and their relationship with each other because for me um, values can be generated through things like belief and and fear and, and response to situations whereas ethics are a part of how we create values or or, and values are how, partly how we create ethics, but for me they're not interchangeable, so I'm not sure if anyone has any, any comments on that, but that's just what I've been thinking about. Thank you. What country, friends, is this? Where the words of our most prized poets can be bought to beautify a patron as unnatural as British petroleum strange association. They who have incensed the seas and shores from a dark, deep water horizon, who have unleashed destruction most foul on Canada's ancient forests, clawing out the lungs from our sickening earth, who still now would despoil the high white arctic in desperate search of more black coals to make them ever richer. These savage villains! And yet they wear a face of bright green leaves, mask themselves in sunshine, and with fine, deceitful words they steal into our theatres and our minds. They would have us sleep. But this great globe of ours is such stuff as dreams are made on, most delicate, wondrous, to be nurtured for our children and theirs beyond. Let not be Peter and these dreams to nightmares. Fueling the future, thou liest malignant thing. Do we sleep? I find not myself disposed to sleep. Let us break their staff that would bewitch us. Out, damn logo! <laughs> Financial leverage, i.e. debt, which imprisons us all in a form of servitude, actually could work the other way around. We can reverse the world, we can turn it back to front, just like stage left and stage right. And we can amplify the impact of divestment by switching banks. But actually, mechanisms and measurements, calculations, and all such things must be subordinate to judgment. And judgment needs to be grounded in values. So financial value is one form of value, and it comes to dominate the world that we live in. It comes to frame our choices. It comes to direct us into saying, well, you know, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it because I don't see anything else on the horizon. But we can see such things, and it's the role of art and performance uh, and critical thinking to bring into sight things which otherwise blink and you'd miss it. Our institutional values might be in conflict with our so-called personal values. Or perhaps we might be subject to a, a range of these things, just as we might be subject to different emotions or feelings according to the colour wheel. So the kind of value that would be really interesting to harness, not to measure or to quantify, but to bring into a kind of collective consciousness would be the one which bears the weight of the financial value system. So the financial value system says it dominates everything and we just have to make our choices, our ethical choices, within the frame as it's been set for us. But I'm saying, actually, that financial value system is nothing without the other system of values, which we all have and are subject to, but could start to reclaim. Thanks very much. This is about the future of arts and culture. We must act. What can you do right now? Just a few little things. Uh, well, we are on strike at the National Gallery next week, starting on Tuesday, and we're going out for five days. 
we needed support. Come along to our picket line every day between 9 and 11. Protest on Thursday at 12.30 at the Board of Trustee meeting. We will then go to DCMS and hand over the petition. Sign the petition and share it with your friend. We've got a week to go, so we'd like to bring it to 50,000 people. You can follow me on Twitter at Clara Park to keep up to date. But you can also support us our campaign. Right now, the Dulwich Gallery uh, are planning to half the number of staff employed there. Or we've got artists occupying the 12 Bar Club in Denmark Street to uh, you know, take it back from developers. We're also building a conference on the 14th of March uh, together with cultural workers, trade unionists, artists and campaigners to discuss the future of art, arts and culture. We'll have a workshop on corporate sponsorship and how you can uh, use creativity to fight it, where it'd be much wider. In the medium term, we really need to do that big piece of work together. We must develop an alternative vision for culture. That includes ethical sponsorship and procurement policies uh, for those big institutions. We've been told austerity is the only show in town. Absolute rubbish. We will need to work together to show to them and prove to them that another work is really possible. Thank you. This is a work that we did uh, just ahead of the, uh, the court case. It's a work called Hidden Figures. Um, and as you'll note, it's a, it's a black square mirroring both uh, an artwork that was in take at the time and also the redactions which you earlier saw illustrated uh, in yellow that were once black um, about words that Tate did not want you to see. I find it extraordinary that somebody like me, through Liberate Tate, publishes Tate's sustainability strategy. Tate did not publish their sustainability strategy, I did, on the Liberate Tate website. Tate did not reveal how they assessed uh, whether or not they would make uh, be a sponsor again. We did. Tate did not, by course, put up its ethics, uh, ethical minutes as a matter of course. You have to ask, they redact, you have to just go through three year legal battles to know these things. Something's wrong with Tate, it's not the institution it should be. Promote a positive vision of what a more ethical cultural institution would look like. And I think although we've uh, been fairly confrontational when I thought that we needed to, we've also tried to point towards what a more ethical take might look like. Um, and perhaps very obviously so by going to an old sponsored institution and putting um, a 1.5 ton 17 metre turbine blade in the turbine blade. And that work, the gift, of course, was pointing towards uh, a different kind of way of thinking about these things. Um, but it was also, uh, we used, I'm not sure if it's widely known, we uh, used the 1992 Museums and Galleries Act to donate the gift to the nation. Uh, and so we supplied with uh, the turbine blade the paperwork. And if you ever decide to donate your work to Tate, the board of Tate is obliged to decide whether or not they will accept that into the nation's uh, art collection, which of course is what Tate's role is. Um, so this had to go to the Tate board, the issue had to go to the Tate board, and um, although there was the biggest petition ever for a particular artwork to be uh, taken into the collection, the Tate board decided uh, that this is the work that they, they didn't want in the national collection. Never mind. <laughs> um, another strategy then, as well as these ones, is of course simply speaking truth to power about what's happening here, about what is wrong with Tate, about what is wrong with our public institutions in relation to oil and the impacts of fossil fuel around the world. And this is the work that we did um, when Tate Britain reopened. And I don't know how many of you are aware, talking of words that have still got British before them, British art uh, is, of course, the national collection is at Tate Britain. And that national collection is now branded 
a BP walk through British art. And we know now how much they're paying for that, along with other things. How did it come to be that we allowed the National Collection of British Art to be walked through by an old company? There we have. Is it inevitable that arts funding is declining? Do we have to accept that? And what can we do to reverse it? And I admit that I probably live in a bit of a naive bubble, if there's such a thing as a naive bubble, because after so many discussions and so many events and years and years of working in the arts, I still can't understand why it seems to be impossibly difficult to persuade successive governments that the arts should be properly funded. What is wrong with them? And what is wrong with us that we can't get them to get it? What more evidence do they need? We know the arts are about values, we know they're about civilised societies, about communities, societies, human potential. They're about empathy, understanding, well-being, health. We know they question, they challenge, they inform, they raise awareness and self-confidence. In doing all this, they can prevent all sorts of horrors that society only ends up having to pay for in the end. They even earn the country money. From all political perspectives, what's not to love? But as Jen said this morning, despite much cleverer than people than me articulating this over and over again, we're still not winning. Since the last spending review, the Arts Council budget was cut by 30%, more than 100 million pounds. In the UK, the arts get 0.05% of government spending. In Germany, it's 1.67. And in 2013, the German culture budget rose by 8%, despite the fact the overall federal budget decreased by 3.1%. In Sweden, it's 2.6%. In France, as was mentioned this morning, artists have special status. So why in the UK is this so difficult? Could it be that the arts are too powerful? Or, or could it be that our governments think they're totally irrelevant? They don't win votes. They might even lose them. Either way, we've a lot to do. We cannot and must not assume that the only way forward is more philanthropic giving and sponsorship. I have something to say about all this, and it's that for me and from my perspective, it's uh, really impossible to make things in an ethical, ethical way using money from companies or governments. It's not possible for me. If all, every company is made basically, even in a distant little level, uh, from exploitation. And it's really difficult to get money from a, a company because money is unethical by itself. From my, from my perspective, also from the governments. I mean, uh, especially the, govern the governments in the first world are all, all, all the well, wealth is based on colonialism and exploitation of uh, all the people, basically. So uh, go, going from, from that point of uh, it's not ethical to take money to make art from any company or govern, I just uh, think the solution or this kind of, uh, to, to be coherent, it's just to, to, to take the money from everyone that can give you the money. And then the important thing for me is not about from who are you taking the money, but what are you doing with that money? The content of the art that you are doing. Because, for example, um, I can be taking money from BP and making a political, a political work that is criticizing BP. We're just in the process of setting up a new community arts um, project in Heathrow. Um, in the villages that are affected by the current airport and the threat of airport expansion and we're looking for artists to come and work with local people um, to kind of partner up um, and demonstrate some of those struggles there and that's connected with all sorts of other environmental and social struggles so connecting all up but yeah if you're interested then come and talk to me after. Finally a big thank you to all of you for giving up your day, your full day to come here and voting with your feet. Um, it means a great deal to us. Um, it was a big deal putting on this event for the three organisations. So we really appreciate it.